Hello and welcome to the Global Leadership Series. In about a week from now, India will celebrate its 71st Republic Day. It's a special occasion for more reasons than one. This year also marks the 30th anniversary of India's diplomatic ties with Central Asia. New Delhi is expected to host a virtual summit with Central Asian leaders. In recent months, there has been renewed momentum in this relationship. Apart from the obvious synergies on trade and security, the situation in Afghanistan has emerged as a pressing problem for both sides. How can India and Central Asia work together on Afghanistan? What does the future hold for this partnership? And how can India and Central Asian partners define the post-pandemic world order. To discuss all of this and more, I'm joined by Jumat Otorbaev, the former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan. Mr. Otorbaev, welcome to Beyond. Welcome. In about a week from now, like I said, India will host a virtual summit with the leaders of Central Asia. It coincides with India's Republic Day celebrations, also with the 30th anniversary of diplomatic ties between the two sides. The leadership of Kyrgyzstan will be attending this virtual summit. How do you assess India's outreach to Central Asia? Uh, actually, uh, I cannot say that we have very extensive, intensive trade relationships between uh, India and Central Asia, and mainly because of logistic reasons. Uh, however, we not forget the old Silk Road when Central Asia plus Afghanistan were the very close linked to India and many cultural events, many historical events have happened between India and Central Asia. Uh, these days, in order to make uh, big investments and trade, you need good logistics. And because of the landscape between Central Asia and India is not very favorable, favorable for that, we don't have too much of trade. Uh, because Central Asia is landlocked. We can't trade over the sea, which is traditional way. However, what we think now is that we will do trade with a very promising railway communication. Uh, what we do now is that we're negotiating with Iran and India to use uh, a very promising port of Chabahar in Iran where, to my knowledge, India invested a lot in order to make possible to open trade between Central Asia and India. This is, will be the first efficient step on making logistic, efficient, cheap trade, fast trade between Central Asia and India. And besides, we have to think of what we can do together to stabilize situation in Afghanistan. Of course, a lot needs to be done, a lot can be done, and I believe both sides are working towards it. India is one of the first countries to have established diplomatic ties with Kyrgyzstan in 1992. And in recent years, both countries have exchanged several high-profile visits, including Prime Minister Modi's visit to your country in 2015 and then again in 2019. As a former Prime Minister of Kyrgyzstan, how do you see the future of this relationship, given all of the challenges that you've just enumerated? Yeah, we have very good relationships. So There's no problem. Uh, currently, we have few uh, tens of thousands of students from India which studying in our universities. In, in our small countries with a population of 6 million, with 1 million in our capital, Bishkek, every day we see Indian students on the streets, which is very good. So I think that we have to continue this. Of course, everybody knows the potential economic potential which India uh, having and how it's developing, everybody really happy that the, as a part of greater Asia, India is a leading force to bring Asia back to the uh, old good times when Asia were uh, carried most of the world GDP. Uh, together with China, India uh, are leading forces, uh, not only in Asia, uh, development, but uh, the world development. So we really would like to be closer to India, especially I would underline uh, uh, tremendous successes with India achieved in terms of uh, digital technology, in terms of IT development. We're really uh, uh, willing to be together in terms of developing of this 21st century new technologies together. and. As I, I, I know, 
well, the political relationships are very good. So why don't we really strengthen it? people-to-people -people communication to get more students from both sides in each region, country. Uh, we are uh, really happy that the last couple of years, Central Asian countries getting much, much closer to each other. So we now will be able to play a kind of unified role in terms of region, since the population in the region uh, in Central Asia is not so big. But if we will be together, it will be visible and important element in the uh, Asian economy. So I think uh, both sides agree on uh, uh, the potential and opportunities for collaboration, but there are also some immediate and pressing concerns. One of them, of course, is Afghanistan. Back in July last year, you wrote that, uh, and I'm quoting from what you wrote, uh, peace must prevail above all within Afghanistan, but peace has been the biggest casualty of the Taliban takeover. How does a destabilized Afghanistan affect your country and your region? It is important that the Taliban claimed many times there is no intention to influence Central Asia. The appreciation of the border, of security concern, this is a very important statement for us. What is now everybody, not only Central Asia, and what all world have to do is trying to see Afghanistan as a reliable, civilized part. Yeah. Uh, so what we're hearing, that there is a political will, however, sometimes we will be required before uh, current uh, leadership of Afghanistan will establish uh, a recognized and efficient public services. We'll, uh, we'll uh, try to fix security situation within, within the country. We'll try to develop economic uh, projects. In that respect, all countries surrounding Afghanistan should uh, play its own role. I am also talking about Iran, uh, Pakistan and China of course, India as well. So we have to come back, get together, and to try to help with the rest of international community to make Afghanistan more predictable, more civilized state that everybody will be benefiting out of. Because we would be connected well through Afghanistan or not, uh, depending on security and predictability situation in that country. Uh, so I'm really hoping that step by step uh, we will be kind of uh, using Afghanistan as a part of greater Central Asia and we'll be linking Central Asia uh, with India, with uh, Indian continent. Right, I'll come to the neighbors in just a bit. Last month, India hosted uh, the India-Central Asia Dialogue to discuss peace in Afghanistan. Do you believe the virtual summit that, uh, that is expected next week can lead to some sort of tangible outcomes on Afghanistan? And what kind of initiatives can India and its Central Asian partners uh, take up and lead to stabilize Afghanistan? Absolutely. In general, it's absolutely critical. I mean, uh, having in mind the, the, the power of the country, a diplomatic weight and ability to assist and then to invest in Afghanistan is tremendously important. I would say that everybody should be thinking of how to uh, create jobs in Afghanistan. In that respect, foreign investments would be the key uh, for that uh, uh, for that goal. In, in that respect, Indian businessmen, business community should really looking at uh, what should they do, what can they do in Afghanistan. A country is tremendously uh, uh, rich in natural resources, for example. So there is no uh, reason why Indian mining companies can't go in and try to explore uh, both hydrocarbon resources and mineral resources. And logistically-wise, if it will be a railway connecting Afghanistan to Iran and to India, uh, it will be perfect, perfect combination. So, but however, everybody understand that first, international community at large also looking after stabilization of situation. Afghanistan to have predictable partner who recognize uh, human rights, rights of minorities, rights of women and girls, uh, will be investing to education and healthcare, 
and then of course then the situation will be improving step by step so it, without doubt the, the subject of afghanistan and stabilization in that country would be one of the prior topics in our communication with all, our, our, with all other neighbors of afghanistan you talk about uh, job creation and foreign investment, uh, but foreign investment will go only when there is stability. Uh, and and uh, the way things are looking at the moment, uh, the Taliban, the current Taliban regime is not living up to any of the promises that they've made to the world community, including, as you mentioned, the rights of women. Uh, how do you assess the role of neighbors like Pakistan? Uh, one of the neighbors that you mentioned in your previous answer in Afghanistan, because Pakistan has actively supported and enabled the return of uh, the Taliban to power. Yes, uh, of course, there is a lot of speculations that the Taliban maintaining very special relationships with Pakistani government, and without, uh, uh, it's not without reason. Uh, actually, uh, push to the tribes, they live not only in Afghanistan, but also in part of Pakistan, uh, as the same people. So the, the idea is that the role of Pakistan in stabilization of Afghanistan can be uh overestimated yeah. but i would say that pakistan should be uh, carrying uh, responsibility in terms of helping uh, to the brothers in afghanistan Pushto, in terms of for example advising how to organize public works how to organize border guards and security situation how to get rid of terroristic groups which currently unfortunately, are based in Afghanistan because of this uh, very difficult uh, geographic and landscapes where they cannot be hiding. Uh, and unfortunately, this long war on terror in Afghanistan uh, brought many people, many especially men, to the situations where, where they can do nothing than to fight. So it will not be easy, but everybody, everybody, all neighbors, should take responsibility on the situation on our guns. Absolutely. Let me ask this again. Do you see Pakistan as part of the problem or part of the solution in Afghanistan? Uh, what I hear from the, from the mass media is that Pakistan is claiming that they will try to stabilize the situation in Afghanistan. I can't judge more or internally what's happening uh, behind the scenes. What, uh, what they do together, how they communicate together, what kind of messages. I only can rely on official channels, which I heard that Pakistan is very much interested in stabilization situation in Afghanistan. And I can't add, add anything else because I'm not too knowledgeable in the internal issues of, uh, in between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, Afghanistan, of course, is not the only uh, point of concern for Kyrgyzstan, for your country. You also share a border with Xinjiang, uh, the region where China has been accused of persecuting more than one million Uyghur Muslims. According to some estimates, there are around 50,000 Uyghurs in Kyrgyzstan. Do you believe the genocide of Uyghurs in China poses a security challenge in your country? First of all, uh, we all, all five Central Asian countries, maintain excellent relationship with China. No problem. No problem. We demarcated and delimited the borders. We have big Chinese investors in all our five countries, very good political relationships. And we trust to the Chinese government on the terms of what they're saying. The words which you're using, they are not really uh, lined up with that. We trust that the Chinese government is responsible and a very trustful partner, and we believe to that. Uh, I know, of course, there is a kind of new Cold War between the United States and China, and each and uh, U.S. using uh, different type of uh, propaganda weapons, including those statements which you just mentioned. But we are uh, it, 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 it is not in the same way as the United States. So we thinking that. Chinese government uh, appreciate human rights and appreciate the rights of minorities, you know, including Xinjiang. Uh, I know many people from Xinjiang, from Uyghur community. Nobody told me that there are big problems or anything else like 
what you just said. I did not even mention the United States. I was talking about the Uyghurs, both in China and in your country. And I was asking, do you believe that what's happening in Xinjiang poses a security challenge to Kyrgyzstan? There is no, no challenge, no security challenge. Chinese, uh, they, they are very strong state, state institutions. And I've been in Urumqi, in the capital of Xinjiang, Uyghur Autonomous Region, many, many times. I communicate with everybody. I didn't see anything what U.S. is claiming to happen there. We have Uyghurs live, live also in my country, in Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan. We're maintaining very good relationship with them. Of course, there are some people who disagree with current policies of the Chinese government uh, in general. But uh, it, all in all, I believe that situation in that autonomous region is stable and predictable. I've seen your previous interviews where you said that all is well in Xinjiang, that there is remarkable development, and uh, you seem to have a very different picture, a very different perception of this region uh, than the rest of the world, including the United States, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, who are all boycotting the Beijing Winter Olympics over China's human rights abuses. Uh, but if we were to go by your assessment, sir, on how things are in Xinjiang at the moment, why do you think China is blocking moves by the United Nations Human Rights Office to investigate these claims of genocide? Why is China not giving the world access to Xinjiang? Yeah, China is a big country. It's the second economy of the world. They have their own priorities in internal and external politics. Uh, if they don't trust the uh, to whatever mission anybody wanted to send. They have all rights to refuse it. Huh? And uh, what I know, there is a fight in mass media between Chinese and uh, Western propaganda. They are not part of this uh, mass media fight. What we know that we, uh, we are in good, very good terms with China, uh, a very important uh, trade and investment partner for our region. We maintain very predictable and stable relationship with them, and we trust to the government of China what they will, what they're claiming. If they don't want any mission to visit their country, they have their own sovereign right to do so. They must not uh, listen to everybody around the world. But of course, dialogue and globalization, these are completely in important and uh, essential elements of our modern world. In that respect, uh, the, we, nobody needs a new cold war. Nobody needs the uh, breathing down of relationship between China and U.S. Everybody knows how huge trade and investment turnover going on between these two uh, leading countries around the world. And the uh, new uh, tension between uh, big international power. No, nobody no, nobody needs. So we in Central Asia really looking after a stable and predictable relationship between all, all countries around the world. Uh, you talk about trust. You talk about the relationship that Kyrgyzstan has with China. Uh, and that's uh, another uh, point that has been uh, raised as a concern in the headlines, Chinese debt. Kyrgyzstan owes around $5 billion in foreign debt, and more than 40% of this debt, that is around $1.8 billion, is owed to China. And this is money that was borrowed over the last decade for infrastructure projects under the Belt and Road Initiative. Do you believe that your country is caught in a Chinese debt trap? Actually, uh, we start to uh, relationship with China much uh, earlier than the uh, Road Initiative has been announced, actually, in Central Asia. So we're really borrowing from China on a very light, easy term, so-called concessional terms. It's kind of World Bank IMF borrowing. Uh, we need to, uh, to develop our infrastructure, including transport and energy infrastructure. And what China is uh, giving to us, offering to us, is good for us. So we're using this money, not only my country, but all Central Asian states, in order to improve uh, people's lives, in order to improve economic development and create jobs. So that is why we negotiating on it, negotiating in equal terms with China on how to, uh, to, to, to execute the joint projects. The same things we're doing with India. 
and on a small scale, but we do it as well. So if there is no kind of dictatorship or whatever political demands, whatever which China never used, why don't we borrow very cheap money and to improve our own economies? We don't have any tensions with China. We are good neighbors and we will continue cooperation in the feasible future. So you say, but last year in February, uh, the new Kyrgyz president, uh, Sar Sadir uh, Zhaparov, raised concerns over the high levels of debt. And you're saying that Chinese money is improving the life of people in your country. But this is what uh, the president said, and I'm quoting, if we do not pay some of the debt on time, we will lose many of our properties. China, like I said, is the largest creditor for Kyrgyzstan, and Beijing has been reluctant to grant large-scale loan waivers. Do you still believe that Kyrgyzstan is benefiting from Chinese money and is in a position to meet its debt obligations? Uh, I know what kind of uh, credit agreement we signing with China. There is no obligation to, uh, to, to, to pledge whatever uh, national property are. Uh, of course, we uh, respect our responsibility and obligations. But in terms of overall debt level to GDP, our debt level to GDP is in sustainable level. And we have a law which not allow from my country to have sovereign borrowing above certain line. We are still below that line and we can comfortably borrow again. So our government really looking very carefully about the level of debt which we have in terms of sovereign uh, credits. In that respect, uh, situation is no dangerous and we are in comfortable situation in terms of continuation of our uh, debt uh, relationships uh, with Chinese. That is good to know because the economic struggles of the people of Central Asia and some of your neighbors have fueled uh, unrest. Uh, recently, there were massive protests in Kazakhstan, I'm sure you're aware, over a sharp increase in, uh, in fuel prices. Uh, dozens were killed in the crackdown that followed there. What are some of the implications of this turmoil for you? Do you believe that there is a risk of such unrest spilling over uh, into other Central Asian states? Uh, actually, it is very bad for Central Asia at large. What happening in Kazakhstan, which is the biggest, not only in terms of territory, but in terms of economy in the, in, in the region. Uh, we can discuss a lot about the reasons and uh, why it happened. Actually, in two words, it's just uh, social uh, inequality, which uh, led to the social unrest of that country. But Within short, within, let me say, 10 days, situation went cool down because Kazakhstan is a strong state, a rich and strong state with responsible citizens. Yeah, there was a disturbances. Indeed, there was a huge tragedy that many dozens of people were killed in the fights. But within short, Kazakh government uh, cooled down the situation and the situation now going back to normal. So we have to all uh, listen and learn uh, lessons which uh, we just observed in Kazakhstan by uh, uh, learning what kind of mistakes have been made and what were the real reasons why we had these disturbances. Another point is that uh, uh, Russia, which played a very constructive role in stabilizing the situation in Kazakhstan as a, our strategic partner, I know that Russia maintained very good relationships with India, and uh, uh, in that situation, Russia really is a very important partner for our region, played a constructive role in cooling down the situation and uh, uh, let so-called terrorist group uh, just disappear from the sea. And uh, our responsibility with the Kazakh government is to stabilize the situation and to so it's interesting, interesting, you see Russia as a stabilizing force in the region and then there are some uh, observers who saw the uprising in Kazakhstan as a rejection of Russian influence on Central Asia. Uh, do you believe that this region and this country in particular, region in general, is becoming uh, a theater for another sort of proxy war between Moscow and Washington? 
Uh, not really, uh, not really. Actually, uh, uh, with Russia, all countries of Central Asia, we're maintaining strategic relationships. We're sharing the common history when we were in one country, uh, which was Soviet Union. We now in different other institutions, like in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, we India also a member. Uh, so we have enormous economic uh, relationship with Russia. There's no political uh, problems. Of course, you have been everywhere in the world, in each country, in each region, so-called nationalistic groups, uh, which uh, may claim that Russia is kind of playing an uh, unfair role in my region, but it's they say in margins. In, in, in Central Asian countries, uh, public people at large, they feel very good uh, about Russian people and Russia itself. So we have very good harmonious relationships, uh, and uh, this will be continued to the future. The pandemic has also sparked a conversation on the need for a new world order, on better international systems. What role do you think Central Asia will play in this post-pandemic world order? Uh, in terms of economic power, Central Asia is not big. However, uh, history plays thousands of Eurasian continent. And Eurasian continent will be enormously important in the 21st century, which is very short. Uh, we didn't let me say something like 25 years, uh, uh, more than half of world GDP be generated in uh, Asia. And we are Central Asia uh, region located strategically uh, very conveniently between three major uh, world powers, between China, India, and Russia. What we have to do is to use friendship with those very influential, important countries to bring our region to uh, predictable, sustainable development. Uh, in that respect, to be bridged between China, Russia, India, for example, would be extremely important. And at the end, we really dream that we could back, go back to the so-called good times when uh, during the times of all Silk Road, Central Asia was the most prosperous part of the world, where the best thinkers, best writers, mathematicians, astronomers, astronomers created the best works which can be done. So we really think that the, to be bridged between big powers in Asia would bring our region to um, a unique situation when when region would be developing very quickly. But, as you said, we need political stability, we need predictability in our neighborhood, we need to work together to build trust between everybody. And the way that all our countries are in Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is absolutely unique, make this uh, idea uh, be happen quicker as we're thinking. So, in that respect, really finding a harmonious relationship with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization would be our goal. Because Central Asian countries were, as a founding member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Jumarta Thorbaev, you made some very interesting points, but for me the biggest takeaway is the fact that you keep focusing on the need to build trust. I think that's very important in an increasingly divided world, uh, the need to build trust between uh, all Thank sides, you. in fact. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being with us here on Vion. It was a pleasure speaking to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much.